Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, this is Hannah Peng. I am the Marketing and Advocacy Manager at Futera. Um, thanks for joining us today um, for this Honest Generation webinar. Um, so this is a piece of research that Futera did last year and we'll walk through um, some of the content of the research today. Um, so it'll be presented by Victoria Wainwright, who is our planning director out of our London office and Emily Viola, who's the head of planning from our New York office. And this is the second in our series called the Imagine Better series, which is um, a series of online events that we are going to be hosting um, over the coming weeks and months, um, just to make sure that our community is up to date on the latest thinking, research and information on sustainability, um, because even though the world is in a very funny place at the moment, sustainability keeps going. So um, please do ask questions. So how we will do it is there is a Q&A function. Um, so please do ask uh, your questions there and feel free to ask them throughout the presentation. And then once um, Emily and Victoria are done, we'll go through and review some of the questions and they'll provide their insight um, at the end of the presentation. So what I am going to do now is hand it over to Emily, um, who will take us through some of the work. Okay, uh, let's go to the next slide. We may have a little pause. Ah, there we go. I am going to start with the end of this presentation, which is how do I get a darn copy of this thing? And the reason I'm starting with this is because we've given this presentation several times and every time we do it, people come up to us afterwards and ask us for a copy or they ask us to give this to their marketing teams. And knowing that a lot of you are joining from the confines of your own homes, as I am here, um, I wanted to just start with our emails right away. So jot them down. And if you have follow up questions that we don't get to during the question answer portion, you can email us directly. Or if there are people who haven't been able to attend this presentation that would like a copy, um, we'll happily send, send you one. Or sometimes we also um, give this presentation to, to others as well. So take those down. And then we're going to start with a picture. So what is this? This is a poster by the niece, the Gen Z niece of our founder when she was six years old about what our world should look like. Looks beautiful, right? Kind of, but let's dissect it a little bit. What does it mean? This is her talking about what she wanted our world to look like in the future and that a world should be one where we are helping it, where we're putting these things, the right things in the recycling and we're cutting down fewer trees and treating men and women equally and using solar panels. And this one, not quite sure what that uh, spelling is supposed to be. We think it's recycling, um, that we should all recycle more. And that is really the idea that this generation is one that knows what they want and they know how to make the world better. And that's really what we, what inspired our founder to start this company, Futera, almost two decades ago. Um, hopefully we are now making the world better, but with hopefully better spelling. Um, and today we have some exciting new insights we wanna to share to you, with you about this generation and how they can help us make this, this better. So this is a group of people who have followed our founder and she has given us really an enthusiastic army of support. And she's been growing this tribe of kindred spirits and fellow travelers built upon the simplicity of a simple idea. And if you haven't heard of the Thomas theorem, uh, one sec before we get to that, it is that that humanity makes true what it believes to be true. So we believe we can change the world, not just by sheer force of belief, but definitely not without it. And that is because the first step is both the easiest and the hardest. And it is believe it is to believe that we can do this. So if we believe that this is the end, we will make it so. If we believe that there is a run on toilet paper and you won't be able to find it anywhere, we will make it so. Some of you may have experienced that just in the past week. But if enough of us believe that we can change the world, then we will put our energies, our investment, and our time towards that, and we will make that the future we want to be. And what it requires is that each one of us does what is in our superpower to do in every company redirects its purpose towards what it can do in this world and does what it is that you can do to the best of your abilities. And because we are experts in sustainability and communications, 
our job then is to make sustain sustainability so desirable it becomes the new normal. So that's what we see as our mission. And when we talk about sustainability, we talk about it more broadly. We talk about brand purpose, social and environmental responsibility, citizenship. And really, we talk about the idea that we are all citizens of planet Earth. And as citizens of this planet, we all deserve clean water, clean air, and not just life, but a livelihood. And that is what we force, um, we, we, we try to help clients bring, bring about. So we've, over the past 18 years, we've had some moments of pride, um, some things that we're really proud about. Uh, this is really more about you guys, so we probably don't need to spend so much time on, on these clients. But if you have questions about any of these projects in particular or others that we've worked on, we are happy to answer them. But what we've seen is we've seen a shift, and I'm hoping that you can feel the difference as well. Just in my short time working here, I have not just seen the difference, I have felt the difference. We are really seeing big changes from big business. We are seeing things like um, big business making sustainability a big freaking deal. Whether it's Microsoft going carbon negative, or Starbucks going resource positive, or Larry Fink's letter about the need to have positive ESG ratings. We are seeing this over and over and over again, and it is changing. We can feel the earth changing underneath our feet. And more and more now, we get what we call the what the think phone call, because all of a sudden, those CEOs that you've been trying to sell in your sustainability platform to you or talk to about brand purpose for the past three years are suddenly calling you on video call and say, where's my big freaking deal? Where's my sustainability platform? Where's my net zero? And all of a sudden you're like, oh my gosh, this is what I've been waiting for for three years and finally the day has come. Now it does feel like we're momentarily on pause during this quarantine, but we're not. As we can see, sustainability doesn't stop. Sustainability stays, stays strong. And once we clear this crisis, there's another one still looming because this crisis in many ways is just a test. As Britta Jewell says, it's not even the big one. There's gonna be other epidemics brought to us by climate change. And while this one wasn't necessarily related to climate change, um, we will see other pandemics. We will see more malaria, we will see Zika. And um, it's in many ways, it's nature's warning call telling us to pay attention to science because it's not just the humans who are choking and dying, it is our planet too. And right now too many of us are feeling what that feels like. And so we need to focus our energy on getting through this crisis, <clears throat> but we can't let our focus on sustainability stop. We can walk the planet health talk, walk the planet health walk while chewing the public health gum. And that's what we need to do because they are entangled after all. And we need to use this pause to gather our efforts like Amsterdam saying, we're gonna take a donut model to mend post, -corona, post coronavirus economy in a more sustainable way. Um, whether it's the armies of people in the UK fighting for morality over economies and being moved in order to support each other. There's this is our great moment of crisis, but it's also a great moment of change. And those who don't come along with us, those who are not part of our sustainable future, are just going to be future dinosaurs. So you're either part of our sustainability, our sustainable future, or you're a future dinosaur. And you are what you burn after all. And so the time has come to ask the question, can your business enrich and not exploit our shared world? And if the answer is yes, now the time has come for you to prove it. Because consumers will add, today's consumers will demand nothing less than this. And if you ask how we know, it's because we've done the research. So we were lucky enough to work with Consumer Goods Forum on um, some foundational research on honest products and claims. And then we were able to do this research again with Gen Z as they life stage and age into heads of household to see how do they feel about sustainability? How do they feel about claims? And how should we talk to them in the most effective way? And what we found is that it used to just begin with transparency, but now it has transformed into honesty. And a new generation of consumers doesn't just want transparency. They just they don't just want the facts. They want the truth 
and they want honesty. So this is your new generation of consumers and they're gonna demand nothing less. And Victoria has the research to share with us to show us how. Fantastic, thank you, Emily. Um, hi, everybody. Um, so uh, the journey of this piece of research, research started um, with this here, um, a really simple question. And um, we started by asking what people really care about when it comes to honesty. And we found that um, both corporate experts that we asked in our panel, um, as well as consumers, agreed on what they found most important, which was product transparency. So 73% of experts, 70% of consumers, both saying they're most interested in transparency about the actual products they buy. So not so much brand level um, transparency or corporate level transparency, but what's actually in this thing that I'm picking up and purchasing. Um, but where we saw a real discrepancy was with how well people think this is actually going. So whilst both parties agreed that that's the most important thing, um, we had 86% of our corporate experts saying that they believe consumers are very or quite satisfied with how much um, transparency they're giving on product sustainability, um, but just 41% of consumers felt that they were actually getting the right level of information. So there was a real discrepancy between these two um, parties um, and we wanted to dig much deeper to understand what's going on um, because we know, having worked with many of you who will be joining us here today, um, just how much hard work is going on in the background to make um, your companies and your products uh, more sustainable. Um, it's tough um, and we know that a lot of that hard work is being done, but it's not translating into that reward of consumers recognising the work that you're doing and feeling that that's um, paying through into the communications that they're getting about their products. So we started by asking um, quite a tough question of, are you honest? Um, and I think we really wanted to understand, is it that um, companies simply aren't being honest enough? Is it that uh, consumers' expectations are changing so dramatically that we simply can't keep up? Or is it that we're not communicating this message in the right way? Um, so we dug much deeper into um, understanding some generational differences um, in responses to, to this question. Um, and the first thing we asked was, um, do you think that brands are honest about these four things here? So are they honest about how their factory workers are treated, how environmentally friendly their products are, how healthy their products are and how safe their products are? Um, and what we found here um, was that well over half of um, millennials in the US um, don't think um, that brands are honest or honest enough about any of these four things. Um, how environmentally friendly products are is just out there in the lead, um, but all of them um, not performing as well as, as we would like to see. But what we couldn't believe when we dug into the generational data was this, which is just how much that increases uh, for Gen Z. Um, so Gen Z are our youngest generation. Um, from being born today right up now to entering the age of 24 uh, this year. Um, so graduating from university, getting jobs, um, developing their own purchasing power, their expectations of how honest they expect companies to be across these four factors are so, so, so high and so much higher than millennials. It's something we didn't expect to see. Um, we thought they would mirror the trend of millennials. Um, maybe it would be increased a bit, um, but this kind of uh, blew us off the scale with over three quarters of all Gen Z um, believing that brands simply aren't honest enough about any of these four things that are so important. Um, this data here um, is US only, um, but here you can see uh, the global amalgamated data for this question too. So we carried out this research in the US, the UK, uh, South Africa and India. Um, and when we amalgamated all four countries, we saw the same pattern um, and trend across all. There are some really interesting um, country nuances in this data, um, depending on lots of things, such as where the economy is at, the political situation, etc. Um, so if you do have any particular interest in digging into US, UK, India or South Africa in particular, um, please, please do get in touch and we can share some of those, those insights with you. But broadly, this is very much a global trend. However, uh, consumers don't just expect you to be honest about what you're doing. Um, they also think um, that brands have a responsibility to make a positive change in the world. When we asked this question, 98% said yes. 
Um, and again, this was a, a global trend uh, with between 96 and 99 percent of respondents in all regions um, agreeing with this statement. I think this isn't a surprise to anybody. Um, this is a trend that's been on the rise for the past decade now um, and has led itself to the rise of cause marketing, of brand purpose, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's no surprise, but we really wanted to check in on um, how are people think, how do people think that this is going, basically? Do they think brands are doing a good job? Um, how do they think they should make a positive change in the world? What's the most important way? Um, and one of the things we dug into, which, which we haven't got time to, to go into in detail here today, is whether people think that we should focus, brands should focus on cause marketing or brand purpose or simply making their own products sustainable. Um, and actually, uh, Gen Z, again, that youngest generation, by far and away, think making your own product sustainable is the most important and positive thing you can do as a business. It's not to say that cause marketing and brand purpose doesn't have its place, but um, more and more in those younger generations, those things are being seen as distraction techniques. So look over here at the good thing I'm doing whilst actually over here, maybe we're not so proud of things in our supply chain or whatever it might be. Um, so you can't really get away with that younger generation of doing kind of those big hero things without getting your own house in order first. Um, and just a quick pause here on um, on the relevance of COVID-19. So this research was all done last year, so obviously pre this crisis. Um, and we've been asking ourselves, you know, how is this relevant? Will it change? Um, does it still stand? Uh, we very much think it does. Um, and actually, one of the things we think is, how is this um, current situation that we're in going to change consumers' expectations of brands? And will it strengthen that expectation that you'll make that positive change even further? And one of the conversations we've been having a lot is um, this idea of brands in service to the world. And will we expect brands to even more deliver something more meaningful in terms of a positive contribution? So rather than a kind of a cause campaign, which might look at raising awareness of an issue over here, we're seeing brands change their production lines to produce hand sanitizer and face masks. So what will the expectations be out of the back of this in terms of the responsibility that consumers, and again, particularly those youngest generations, think that you have to, to make a positive change? But before all that happens, uh, we asked, um, are you satisfied with the positive change that brands are currently making in the world? Um, and actually, we were quite surprised to see um, that broadly millennials are pretty happy um, with, with what's happening. So the top row here of the, the donuts that you can see, um, the dark blue and the grey are the those who responded saying they were very satisfied or somewhat satisfied. Um, so you can see the vast majority of people are actually pretty happy with, with what brands are doing at the moment. If we uh, just add in Gen Z there, um, what you can see is a global trend across all regions of basically the dark blue, which is the very satisfied getting smaller, and the bright pink, which is the not satisfied getting bigger. So on the whole, Gen Z are actually still pretty pleased um, with the, the work that brands are doing to create positive change, which means that the hard work that businesses are doing is paying off. Um, but that dissatisfaction is growing amongst that younger generation. Um, different countries are at different stages of this journey, as you can see, again, that the nuances in the country data there, um, but the pattern remains the same. The big surprise is the US on the left. You see a huge swing away from that big dark blue, 64% um, up at the top left there um, of millennials saying they're very satisfied with brands, which shrinks right down to 12% for Gen Z. There are so many reasons why this might be happening that we, we can't get into today, politics, big business, etc. cetera. Um, but there's definitely a big, big shift happening in the US. And um, we believe that that is um, closely following suit across other regions around the globe as well. We wanted to understand a bit more about who is kind of winning um, in terms of, of honesty, what types of brands are doing are doing the best. Um, and we asked quite a simple question, um, which type of brands do you think are the most honest? Uh, familiar household name brands, so your big, long established, long standing brands, um, or your small business brands. So that's more your uh, disruptors um, who are causing headaches uh, for a lot of those bigger businesses and really shaking up their status quo. We call those the, the born good brands. Um, and again, we were quite surprised to see for millennials, um, actually the vast majority still think that those big familiar household name brands 
are still the most honest, um, which is super interesting and just goes to show the power of brand loyalty, brand familiarity, brand equity. These things still really, really stand, even in a period of time when everything is changing rapidly for businesses. Um, those things still have enormous power um, and can absolutely be harnessed for, for good as long as you meet your consumers' expectations by being honest and sharing your progress on sustainability with them. Um, and then when we add in Gen Z, um, again, what we see here is, is similar to the slides before. Um, the trend is the same um, across all regions, but we see trust um, in those familiar household name brands um, falling down and those responding that they think those smaller disruptive brands are more honest going up. So again, the majority, US again being the exception, um, still believe that those big brands are the most honest, um, but we can see it shifting away towards those smaller disruptors. And um, what we think this is saying really is that there is still plenty of time as a big business to really invest in being honest about your progress and in sharing that transparently with your consumers. Um, they believe you and they still uh, love you, they still follow your brands, um, but the time to act is now because we can see that trend um, swaying away. Again, um, the US by far out there in the lead in terms of this trend uh, with the UK hot on the heels um, and South Africa and India um, coming behind. But we do think this is a global trend that will we'll follow suit across all <clears throat> as it has in the US. And what we're finding increasingly is um, that the benefits of being honest far outweigh um, the risk of um, not sharing this information. Um, a question we get asked so often um, by clients is, you know, is it really worth going out and sharing, proactively sharing information that maybe, you know, in areas we're not so proud of or where we know we're not doing quite as well as we want? Um, every business has got areas where they're not doing as well as they want to be. I think it's incredibly difficult to make change. We all know that and um, we're all working together to try and do that. Um, but so long as our systems are currently the way that they are, it's tough um, to create fully traceable, sustainable, um, ethical supply chains, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and consumers understand that they're savvy, they're knowledgeable and they understand how the world works. They don't expect anybody to be perfect. Um, but if they discover that you're not honest or you've deliberately withheld information about something that they really care about, um, then that's when you really feel the pain. Um, and what we find reading this slide is that basically the most common action people will take in the situation is that it will end in them not buying your product. So the top three there, not buy it, choose an honest alternative or hold off buying and do more research are by far the most chosen options with choosing an honest alternative out there in the lead. Um, what we see is uh, millennials are more likely to be a bit more forgiving. So 15% um, would still buy a product, um, but they would get in touch with you and um, to ask you kind of what's going on. Um, but just 6% of, of Gen Z would give you that chance. Um, and 10% of millennials would buy that product anyway, but dropping to 8% for Gen Z. Um, so we are starting to build this picture that actually the risks of withholding information far outweigh the risks of, of proactively sharing it in a way that people can understand. And then another thing we dug into um, was industry. Um, what we found was that actually uh, not all uh, industries are created equal when it comes to honesty. Um, so we asked consumers to rank um, in order um, how, uh, which of these industries they believe to be the most honest. Um, and we can see here that for millennials, just uh, a quarter and just over a quarter respectively, um, believe that personal and baby care, followed by food, um, are the most honest industries. Um, and then we can see all falling quite close together, uh, phones and tech, household cleaning, beauty and cosmetics, and clothes and fashion, um, all coming in quite low in terms of the most honest industries. Um, off the back of this piece of research, uh, just going back one slide, Thank you. Um, we uh, decided to dig in a bit more into uh, fashion, into um, what was going on there. So we've produced an honest fashion report. Um, so if that's an industry you work in and want to know more about, please, please get in touch. Um, and cosmetics as well. Um, we've done the honest cosmetics report, um, which is an area we think is particularly interesting because um, transparency within fashion has been spoken about for a long time. It's hot on the agenda and has been for a while, particularly since the Rana Plaza disaster back in 2013. 
But cosmetics is an area that hasn't um, had such a spotlight shown on it. Um, and we think this one is, is hot on the heels um, and an area where consumers are really starting to ask questions. Um, so if anyone uh, works in that industry and would like to like us to share those insights, uh, please, please do give us a shout. Um, and then moving on to Gen Z, um, we can see here that um, Gen Z uh, pretty much follow the same trend as millennials on this one. Um, a bit more skeptical of most industries than millennials, but again, the pattern is the same. The one outlier is up there at the top with baby and personal care. Um, Gen Z are more likely to rank that industry as being the most honest. Our best bet here is that um, Gen Z are relatively far less likely than millennials to have children. So perhaps I haven't encountered any uh, bad or negative experiences in that um, sector yet. Um, maybe more likely to think it's sacred, um, the most likely to be honest, um, but millennials perhaps less so and maybe have had those personal experiences. Um, but just a hypothesis at the moment for that one. And then the final thing that um, I'll just add before I, I pass back over to Emily to um, kind of explore what on earth is going on and why we're seeing um, such dramatic shifts in the data between millennials and Gen Z is this very simple question. So we often ask a question using this type of construct when we're doing insight work for our clients um, because it tends to um, flag um, quite surprising things. Um, so we simply asked both millennials and Gen Z, how much do you care about honesty? And 89% of both generations um, rank themselves as caring a lot about honesty. So that was seven or above on a one to 10 scale. But then we asked, how much do you think brands care about honesty? And what we saw is this really stark difference. So we've got millennials saying 89% we really care, but just 66% of millennials think brands care as much as they do. Um, but for Gen Z, that goes from 89% believing they really care to just 42% believing brands care as much as they do. Um, and it's these types of discrepancies when we start to really feel the pain points of consumers not trusting us um, because it suggests that we don't share their values. So we might be working on the same issues, we might be talking about the same things, but if they don't feel like they share that conviction that they do, they're going to start really scrutinising and asking some really, really tough questions. We know, and again, those of you who have joined us here today um, are passionate about this and working really, really hard to make our brands and products more sustainable and to communicate that to our consumers. Um, but for whatever reason, that isn't cutting through and, and they're not believing that we think the same as them. Um, so back over to Emily to help us understand uh, what is going on with Gen Z. Thank you, Victoria. So what the think is going on here? What do we see that's different? And the difference is that Gen Z have proved so far that they are not just mini millennials. That's okay, you can go to the next slide. So millennials opened the doorway. They were the opening act, they opened the stage door. They are the ones who were raised with this idea that you're not supposed to be raised to fit in a mold. You're to be raised to break the mold and that you need to establish your own values and your own way of looking at the world and they demanded the same from brands and we saw a renaissance in terms of brand purpose and csr initiatives and really brands trying to repositioning reposition themselves along the lines of values and shared values but with Gen Z, we see something different. We see the honest generation. They are not here just to be to align with values. They do not just want to break the mold, break the molds. They want to change the freaking world. And they know there's not a lot of time to do it. And so they're much more pragmatic. They're a generation of doers, of activists, of realists. They want to see real action and big promises and glossy marketing campaigns are not going to be enough for them. They are demanding more and speaking truth to power is their superpower. So while they seem like, uh, as our founder Solly calls, some serious little dudes, they are now serious little heads of households and will continue to be. So we have to understand how they're different than their millennial cousins. While millennials drove brands to be purposeful, Gen Z are demanding brand proof. And we'll talk a little bit more about that soon. They're a generation that was raised to question fake news, be suspicious of secrecy, and hold sincerity as sacred. They are the honest generation and they don't expect brands to be perfect. This is really important. It is more important for them that brands be truthful than that they be completely clean and completely perfect. So the honest generation is here. 
they are aging into head of household status and we're going to need to figure out how to talk to them and how to market to them and how to talk to them about sustainability. And so what you'll see on the next couple of slides is a little bit of a primer on how you can do your best and do best by them. And the first point here is that we first need to really see them and see where they're coming from. This is the largest generation yet, and they're coming of age in a world that is post-truth, post-privacy, highly fraught, and they're scared. On one hand, they've got threats of globalization threatening their jobs and threats of automation on the other, and in many ways, they are standing here like the most unfun of fun house floors shifting under their feet, and the only thing they can hold on to is themselves. And so, their trust in government and business are at record lows and their concern about the future and their economy and the future of our planet are at record highs. And so brands need to adjust and figure out how to talk to them. So the first thing is that it's we must go beyond corporate practices and beyond brand practice, brand purpose, excuse me, to product proof. For a generation for which skepticism has become a survival instinct, they require more than brand purpose. They require proof at the product level. So it's not just how is this company progressing or does this brand align with my values, but what is the actual impact of the thing am I, I am buying? Am I adding to our world? Is my, I'm not just thinking about my carbon footprint, but my karmic footprint. Am I doing more good than bad with purchasing this product? The second is to understand that the difference between transparency and honesty isn't just a trait, it's a skill set. So honesty might be the next disruptor over the next three to five years, but it requires upskilling. It's beyond transparency training and it's a new language. And this is a language that Generation Z is being brought up to be fluent in and that we as older marketers are learning how to read and how to talk and how to speak. And um, recently we were at a, giving this talk at a conference and a, a Gen Z participant said, oh yeah, my friends and I last night, we were comparing your GI, GRI reporting to your brand purpose and we just laughed at looking at the gaps because your brand purpose says one thing, your reporting says another and we can see the gaps and it's not working. So honesty isn't a trait, it's a skill set and it requires several steps. So. We will send this out afterwards for anyone who's interested, so I'm not going to go through each one um, in depth, but it's about having good intentions, making humble claims, be constant beta and being a work in progress because companies like humans are not perfect and they're changing. And the difference between transparency and honesty is that transparency is a corporate idea while as honesty is a human one. So you have to be a work in progress like a human. Go above and beyond, be truly helpful. And that brings us to the next step, which is that building trust requires vulnerability. And Brene Brown talks about the power of vulnerability and the strength in that. And this is really about talking like a human. So what we see is it's about less posturing, more personing. How can people embody honesty? Think about that. What do people say? They're humble. They have a reputation. They're open about their flaws. How can a product do that? Well, be open. Say, you know, we're not 100% recycled yet, but we're working on it. Or there's a little bit of GMO in here, but we're sourcing new ingredients. It's not about being perfect. It's about being truthful. So less posturing, more personing. The next one is to understand that trust isn't completely gone. A lot of times people talk about the decline of trust and the decline of, of truth. And trust hasn't completely been eliminated, but it has been reassigned. And people are moving from experts to experts, And those are people that they trust um, because they're credentialed differently, either from their number of followers or their personal experience, or you know them personally. So brands need to understand their place on the influence curve. They can get into that highly trusted place, but they have to first be able to overcome and cross over the honesty gap. So the difference between millennials and Gen Z is that with millennials, we were able to rest over here on this left side with defensible intent, which is transparency that's not so transparent or, you know, 
just showing the things that you want to show. But for Gen Z, you have to cross over that chasm to believable impact. This is about openness. This is about showing your progress. This is about being an advocate and a leader. And that is the difference between a brand's values and a brand's actions. Number five is that brand product, excuse me, brand purpose must translate to product proof. Consumers are looking for evidence and consistent results. They don't just want a glossy marketing campaign. I love glossy marketing campaigns. I built a career on <laughs> creating glossy marketing campaigns, but for this generation, it is not enough. So what is it at the product proof level? How are you living your values at the product proof level? And then how are you proving it? So here are a couple of examples of, of companies who are doing this quite well. So Arla, who has CCTV cameras um, on their farms to show you, and quite honestly, we'll say 95% of their cows were able to get milked at will. That's not 100%, it's 95%, but they are being very honest about that and letting you see. Everlane doesn't just show you their process on their website, they invite people in through Snapchat on Transparency Tuesday, every Tuesday to come in and ask questions about the factories and how things are made. Native deodorant doesn't just tell you what ingredients are in their product, they tell you why they've chosen those ingredients and what they will do. And then Mercedes-Benz is an example of a brand that is a work in progress. They're saying we haven't quite reached our ambitions for 2039, but let us tell you what we're doing. We are using blockchain to track this information so that we can get better. And it's an example of a company getting credit for being on the journey and not having arrived all the way. Number six is to have the courage to turn crisis into change. It takes courage to be vulnerable, but Gen Z values the ability to change. They value human growth and they value the idea of saying, we were wrong, we will be better. So as an example of the honesty skill set in action, you can master the corporate culpa. Know when to say you're sorry. Say it quickly like Sephora, like Starbucks and embrace change. Don't be afraid to be in constant beta because people will value, especially Gen Z, they will value your ability to transform more than they will blame you for flip-flopping. The seventh is that honesty is not passive, it is active. And anyone who was at Greenbiz this year may have heard Temple Grandin talk about getting the suits out of the office, get the marketers out of their cubicles or their kitchens, as that's where they happen to be. And when it's safe, get them back on the factory floor, get them to see what's going on. Honesty doesn't mean just telling what you know. Honesty is about searching for new information and new solutions. And finally, honesty is active, but it's not a substitute for action. It is not enough. It is only the beginning. It is a way of life and it is a philosophy. And it is something that we will learn as we go. So um, we do have a few provocations. We also have, um, which may be even more useful, a couple of questions that were listed um, in our chat. And please do feel free to ask additional questions and we'll try to answer them. So some of the questions I know people have had um, around, you know, what is the relationship with COVID? How will that change um, some of this approach to truthfulness? And I will turn it over to Hannah to then moderate our discussion. Great, thank you so much, Emily and Victoria for walking us through the Honest Generation research um, and the insights between and differences between Gen Z and millennials, um, especially in light of everything that's happening in the world at the moment. So before diving into some of the provocations that we've been talking about, just turning to a couple of the questions that, that folks have asked. Um, so one, Jordi, yes, the slides will be shared and available after um, this, as well as the recording of it. Um, someone named Nic Nicola McLaren has asked, can you say more about the difference between transparency and honesty? And Victoria, can I come over to, to you for that? Absolutely, yes. Um, so this uh, research started um, 
about two years ago now, um, when we were basically trying to understand um, why do we have this decline in trust and decline in people um, believing that brands are, are doing the right thing when actually we're at a moment in time when brands are doing more than ever in terms of increasing their reporting and um, making their information more transparent and available online. Um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what we found was there's basically a difference between transparency, um, which is making information available um, if you really want to find it um, and if you're smart enough to know how to navigate it and can understand it, which actually, if you don't work in sustainability, understanding kind of complex sustainability reporting is not really accessible to most people. Um, versus honesty, um, which we define as um, proactively communicating information um, on topics people care about in a way that they can easily understand. So it's basically using your communications channels um, to communicate and put as much effort and love into those communications as you would any other brand message that you were trying to um, get out there, rather than simply complying with um, what you might need to do or maybe going one step further and publishing more data, but very much keeping it somewhere where someone has to seek it out and find it rather than kind of yeah communicating it to them proactively. Great, thank you. And I'm seeing a couple of questions as well asking about the research, just looking at the markets that we selected, um, if there's going to be any more um, research done in the future in other markets. Um, and then if you could also cover um, in the research that we did, did we look at, I see a question from Simo, Simo um, asking if we gathered evidence of actual behaviours versus just declared ones. Great. Um, so firstly, on the regions, um, so we were really keen to, to make this as global as possible, um, which is why we chose a uh, form um, across the globe. Um, so US, UK, India, South Africa. Um, the actual reasons for choosing those four are a combination of what was practical and um, possible, um, along with regions that we were finding really interesting. Um, so uh, we wanted to make sure, obviously, that we weren't just in heavily westernised markets, so we wanted to go beyond the US and UK. Um, working with CGF and their brands and what they were looking for, um, we uh, ended up uh, selecting India and South Africa. Um, they were also um, regions that we could work with on the research platforms that we, we were using. Um, so a combination of what was interesting, uh, how to get the most global perspective and what was possible. Um, we would love to do research in, in more regions, absolutely. Um, that I think the more that we can kind of dig into this and the better global picture we can understand, the better. Um, if there are any regions in particular anyone is kind of like crying out for wanting to know more on um, and why, uh, please, please do let us know. Um, we, would, we would love to, to dig further. Um, the second question was, uh, was yes, was about um, looking at evidence of actual yes. behaviour versus just declared ones. Yeah, um, that, that's a, a, a great question um, and, and one that unfortunately we haven't been able to dig into specifically with this piece of research. Um, but what I will say is that um, that's something that we we constantly ask ourselves, um, not just on this on this project and thought leadership, but at Futera more widely. Um, it's it's a conundrum that we all face kind of every day. Um, we are starting to see um, trends in consumer behaviour uh, follow through on claim behaviour um slowly um but it is behind and, and will remain so for, for a long time i think um but uh but yeah uh, we we do think that we are going to start to see that that fall through into into consumer behavior as well at some point but i wish i could give you uh, hard evidence and data on that one but unfortunately i can't great thanks um and just before diving into more um questions from our audience I want to come come back to the point that um, Emily you were making earlier and just if you can explain a little bit more of you know what how are um, the honest generation responding to COVID-19 will they demand even more of brands and what will that look like I think what we're seeing I think COVID-19 in many ways is a way of of coalescing coalescing a lot of things that were already happening so when we see a, a distrust of information, I think one of the things that we're going to start looking for and we'll start seeing Gen Z develop as they become um, captains of industry in their own right is how do we 
uh, counter things like deep fakes and fake information with deep verification. And they're going to be looking for third party um, proof, third party validation, ratings and rankers. And it's that um, that unbiased uh, kind of check mark, the kind of what would be the equivalent of a blue check on all information. I think that is something we're going to see more and more. And COVID has really just made it more urgent because it's not just about the quality of information. It's about the impact of that information on public health. So I put this question out to everyone. How can you help us um, um, become not just uh, media literate, but uh, become armies of, of positive information. And how do we increase media literacy in our world through things like deep verification? Yeah, and that, that goes to a question that I'm seeing come up from our audience as well. I'm asking, are there tools that businesses can use to showcase the transparency of their supply chains to ensure honesty? And they um, included Lush as an example of, um, of of a company who has identified how who is the who are the people behind who make their products. So this is something I would be happy to talk about um, individually at, at length in in a particular category. It I would say, and I invite anyone else to to weigh in here, but I would say the different. Um, uh, different silos or, or I should say uh, different verticals have different ways of addressing things like raiders and rankers and there are, are, are a couple that I would recommend but the the key here is to understand who those parties are along along um, the entire value chain from not just the associates and the say wearers of your clothes but the makers of your clothes and understand kind of the different tiers of your supply chain um, but there isn't a one size fits all for for every single vertical. Yeah, and Victoria, I'm gonna to come to you next um, with a question from Tiffany who asked if we've conducted research like this with regard to the boomer generation and just wanting to understand a little bit more of the differences that we saw across the board with generations um, in addition to, to what we saw with millennials and, and Gen Z. Sure, um, so that is, Another great question and something um, we spent quite a lot of time uh, scratching our heads on, to be totally honest, when we first got this research back. So we have looked at um, uh, boomers and Gen X, as well as millennials and Gen Z, um, so the full, full spectrum. Um, and what we found, um, and this basically needs an entire piece of research done in its own right to really kind of dig into and understand um, the shifts. Um, but we saw that uh, boomers were uh, more skeptical um, and less trusting of brands. Um, Gen X were more so, more trusting, um, more believing that brands were doing uh, good things, positive things. Um, this continued to increase with millennials who were the most trusting and most positive um, in believing that brands were doing good things and then plummeted with Gen Z. Um, so it's a really interesting curve that we saw. Um, the reason we didn't go into all of that detail today in this report is it's, it's far too much um, to, to kind of dig into in, in one short hour. Um, but again, if that's something people are interested in, in knowing more about, um, we'll be really happy to share some of those data points and, and discuss what that might mean further. I think some of the early hypotheses we were developing around that was um, this idea of the post-war generation. Um, and I think there might be interesting parallels now with coronavirus and what can we learn with that dip in that journey um, post-war uh, versus now and this big shift that we're currently living in in society. Um, but there definitely seemed to be kind of an increased skepticism with, with that, the oldest generation that we looked at, boomers, and parallel, parallels of the youngest generation of, of Gen Z. Great, and with that, um, I have a question here from someone named Laura, who's asked if we can share a little bit more about the thinking and analysis as to what is the bigger shift here that's happening, that's creating and causing this desire for honesty. And I know we touched on that a bit with some context around what's mm -hmm. happening with the world with you know, access to information, with technology, even what's happening now with COVID-19. But could you speak a little bit more around what is this bigger shift around the desire for honesty? 
Yeah, absolutely. And and I would love other people's thoughts on this as well, um, because there is no kind of uh, scientific answer to this. But um, certainly the, the analysis and thinking that we have done, um, we think that there is uh, something really interesting. Well, two things going on. One, very much around that availability of information. Um, so simply, um, it's not good enough for a brand just to say one thing. And we have to believe that and um, we have access to multiple different data sources, whether that's uh, news, online, chat forums, reviews, friends, influencers, social media, um, academic reports. Um, we're all far more literate um, and able to access information on a scale that generations before never could. Um, so we're far more able to identify when things don't smell quite right and we know that things are being withheld. Um, there's also been a cultural shift in terms of how formal we are with each other. Um, we tend to have a much more kind of colloquial, um, a flatter structured society um, where we tend to um, converse more human to human across all walks of life. Um, and I think there's a bit of an element of expecting brands to talk to us on a level as well. Um, and that really comes with this shift in, in trust. So Emily touched on, on the issue of trust earlier. Um, and there has been this real narrative of, of trust is broken, it's gone away. Um, but actually what we know is it hasn't gone anywhere. It's just been dispersed um, into multiple different sources. Um, and again, we're, we're not used to anymore being uh, operating in a kind of parent-child relationship where institutions hold all the power and all the lines of communication and we as consumers are the child and we, we just have to receive that information and, and take it as true. Um, so whether that would be um, a doctor or whatever it might be, we would just simply have to take that information as, as what we know. Um, whereas now that trust has been really dispersed um, and we might still go to the doctor and that'll be really important, but we might also do our own research and, and, and fact check in other places. We might even read academic reports. Um, so that uh, kind of um, holder of information has, has really changed. So we don't expect to be spoken down to in this kind of authoritative way anymore. And we certainly don't expect to just accept it as truth, um, but rather we expect to have a more kind of adult to adult conversation um, about the information at hand and what, what might be going on. Great, and I see another question asking, and I know we did give some examples later in the presentation around which brands and businesses do you think get honesty right? And I don't know if you have any others to add, either Victoria or Emily, um, but I'm wondering as well, have you seen any great examples more recently of what brands or businesses are doing, especially around their efforts around um, COVID-19 that you think would be um, good ones to call out? Not off the top of my head, Emily, do you have any? Uh... Uh, yes, can you, am I live now? Um, I, a couple, uh, I'd say, I mean, Tyson, Oatly, Chipotle, there are a couple of brands that we, we end up talking a lot about, of course, Everlane and Patagonia. But I'd say um, we are at the beginning of a new explosion in technologies like things like blockchain that will allow us to track products to not just to a specific region, but to an individual farm and really change the provenance of where your products come from. So I'd say the world of transparency is um, still very much, it's very much up for grabs of, of who will wear the crown and it's a crown that can be shared by many. Um, but there are many uh, different things, whether it's the internet of things or blockchain or comparing these things together to really just give us more information. And so often the mis link is the data. So the more that we can use data to help us make smarter uh, smarter purchases, I think the more we will see ourselves not as um, the children in that parent-child relationship, but as equals, if not um, consumer as parent. Great. And another question that has come in is, I think about, the, the question is, how, as Gen Z gets to know life as they grow up, as they get into work, start having to pay their own bills, how long will honesty still be a key value for them when it comes when it comes to, to brands? And that kind of relates to one of the questions that we had in the provocations as well, which is how will the expectations we place upon brands to create positive change in the world evolve? So looking at honesty for Gen Z, as well as our expectations for brands in general, how do we expect those to, to grow and change and evolve over time? 
I think that we will naturally see some falling off as more Gen Zers end up in corporate businesses and become more forgiving. Um, but what we see more broadly happening um, that speaks more to it not going away is the fact that Gen Z acts very differently inside of these corporations. They are not looking for a profession. They are looking for a platform. And so what they are doing is, um, I mean, I, I can't even tell you every day I get, I get LinkedIn requests from people in college asking me, how do I get into sustainability? How do I turn sustainability um, into a part of my job function? How do I apply these, um, these tenets to something completely separate? And I think more and more we will see Gen Zers uh, require uh, as much from from the people that they're working for. So I think in in some uh, respects, we'll see a leveling off of intensity just because they'll be faced with the realities of their business. But in others, we'll see them remaking business in their own image. So I think the the question is out there and, and let's watch. But um, I also think they feel the urgency of like, we've got 10 years, so you you don't have time to wait those 20 years to become like CMO of a company. We have to act now. Great, and I know we're starting to run out of time now, so just wanted to turn it back over to, to both of you and Victoria, maybe we can start with you. Any final um, thoughts or um, messages that you want to leave our audience with before we wrap up? Thanks, Hannah. Um, just want to thank you all for taking the time to, to listen today. I think this is an area I'm uh, personally really passionate about, really interested in. Um, I think honesty has got a massive role to play in society and in kind of shaping the response that brands take um, to, the, to the current world that we live in. And that seemed relevant last year and, and now more so than ever, given the current situation. Um, I think personally we're uh, amongst those who are privileged enough to be able to kind of sit and discuss these issues right now and, and think about how we might shape them and, and use them for good um, going forward. So um, if anyone else has any questions or thoughts or their own theories, um, yeah, please do get in touch. We'd really love to keep the conversation going. And Emily, any final thoughts or words well, of wisdom from you? The last thing I'll say is something I said earlier, uh, which is that we all need to figure out what we have at our disposal to make the world a better place. And that is the challenge now. So if you're Google and you're amazing at data, use more data for good. If you're Amazon and you seem to have cracked every sort of distribution problem, how do we distrib distribute things more equally to our planet? What is it that you are in the business of doing? What is your purpose? And how do you elevate that purpose to make the world a better place? We, as I mentioned, are in the business of sustainability and communication. So this is what we do. We get out there and we tell the world how to do it better. But my question is to you, what can you do? What can you give? And how do we give back to this planet more than we take from it? Great. Thank you both um, so much. Um, and again, if you have any further questions, both Emily and Victoria are available. If you do have uh, any more questions, and also we will send out um, the recording and a write-up, um, including the slides after this webinar. Um, so we will be in touch soon. Um, but yes, please do get in touch if you have any uh, further questions. And thank you so much for joining. And everyone, stay safe and enjoy the rest of your day.